Good evening, my name is Karen Harding and I'm just going to give you a run through of a PowerPoint presentation prepared for a seminar for tomorrow. And uh, this one is the overview of the court's approach to the sentencing of third or subsequent drink drivers. The maximum penalty for driving with excess breath or blood alcohol third or subsequent offence in New Zealand is a term of imprisonment of up to two years imprisonment or a fine of $6,000 with a mandatory disqualification of a year and one day unless other provisions apply including section 65 of the Land Transport Act which is indefinite disqualification with an order to attend an assessment centre or if the person is going to apply under our current law which ends on the 1st of July 2018 under section 65A of an alcohol interlock disqualification which is a three month disqualification for we can get the alcohol interlock license or if a person is able to make a special reasons application under section 81 the no disqualification to be imposed or partial disqualification if the reasons that led to the person doing the drink drive or traffic offence are uh, related to something similar to an emergency urgent type situation uh, which is special outside the ordinary run of cases so as to uh, justify the person not being disqualified. So it doesn't amount to a defence, to a defence, but it's a extenuating or mitigating circumstance uh, that would justify the person not to be disqualified. Also, um, if the person is um, able to come within Section 94 and make an application for a community basis, such as community work or community detention instead of disqualification, uh, then uh, they wouldn't have the mandatory penalty. Um, the situation is going to change after the 1st of July because there are mandatory periods of disqualification now uh, required to be imposed under the new regime that starts on the 1st of July and under Section 65A. E. So section 65A, which is your alcohol interlock section, is, is, is going to be a goner. It's replaced with section 65AB all the way to section 65AK and we have alphabet soup. And if your client comes within those sections, they're going to have a mandatory sentence. And the only way to avoid that if there's special reasons relating to the qualifying offence. Now that's completely different from our section 81 special reasons. So the special reasons related to a qualifying offence will be, for example, if the person has a medical condition certified by a medical practitioner um, that they're not able to provide a breath sample. So that's your emphysema people. Or they don't don't live um, anywhere near a, a service provider, very rural people, they're not prepared to drive there. If they don't have a vehicle that an alcohol interlock can be fitted on, they're not ever going to get a vehicle that they can fit an alcohol interlock device on, or if they've never held a New Zealand driver's licence. So those will have special reasons relating to the qualifying offence, which is different from our section 81. So those are some issues relating to disqualifications. So it's um, important when you're dealing with your third or subsequent offender to get all comprehensive information you can on the person, on their personal situation, and also that you need to do your client care documents to get an authority under the Privacy Act and to get disclosure. So the client will tell you what happened at the offence, why they were driving and what vehicles doing what for what purposes and how this happened. You also want to find out from what happened during processing that they uh, can recall. And uh, you will also need to check their conviction history because it's uh, very important how many convictions they have on their history. Just because they seem historic does not mean they can't be taken into account. They must be taken into account. It just becomes relevant in terms of their overall aggravating feature of uh, the dates of when these previously have occurred. So punishment increases the more drink drive convert, uh, convictions a person has on their record and Electronic sentences will need to be assessed uh, for most third or subsequent drink drivers. They're not available in all areas of New Zealand. For example, there are rural areas where the probation officer can't get there, where there is no cell phone coverage or landline suitable coverage uh, to provide the electronic monitoring or a landline can't be put in. And also in places like Waiheke Island, uh, there is no electronic monitored sentences available. So if your client is going to plead guilty, then um, the Bail Act is relevant and Section 13 may result in their bail being revoked uh, on a guilty plea. So you need to set up uh, things uh, before that happens to make sure your client's in appropriate uh, rehabilitation and got it all organised so that you will need to make a bail application. Also, you have an option at the Auckland and Waitakere District Courts for your serious third or subsequent drug and alcohol offenders, which is the Alcohol and Other Drug Treatment Court, known as Drug Court, or the AODTC. 
and we also in preparing your cases recommend in relation to your third or subsequent drivers that you engage your client in rehabilitative programs it's very important uh, you want to get the best sensing outcome and the best sensing outcome will happen if your client has engaged in rehabilitation and lowered their risk of reoffending and to do that you're going to need to triage their needs and try to problem solve with a solution focus uh, applying holistic principles and with an underlying philosophy of therapeutic jurisprudence if you're going to get the best result for your clients because you really need to know your people and you need to do everything you can to address the problems and to stop the recidivism and the court's going to need to feel confident that the person's on the path to redemption and not going to be reoffending again so rehabilitation is so important ideally sentencing should be after their completed programs to get the maximum credit uh, because, you know, for example, there is often a sense of such as community detention or home detention might not be available in a residential or residential facility. Um, and then certainly not available in some places like boarding houses. So your client's going to be set up in the right place to get the right electronic sentence. If your client doesn't live in an address where they can get an electronic sentence, then they might only be able to get community work and supervision. But if that is not enough punishment in relation to the overall deemed hierarchy of the sentence that must be imposed for offending, particularly with these aggravating factors, then you're setting that client up to go to jail. So you need to really transverse with them what their living options are, and perhaps make them look for alternative addresses so they have a backup address for electronic monitoring. Make sure that you also uh, get your client to go for an alcohol assessment. That's really important. I actually find a written alcohol assessment report's really helpful. Uh, the court's going to assume your client has an alcohol problem. It's really helpful to actually find out what exactly it is. So your client's going to need to pay for that, or you're going to have to organise that on legal aid for a subsidy to, to pay for that. And you can get written alcohol assessment reports from Care New Zealand, for example, in Manukau. It's $405 and also includes a counselling program and also three individual sessions to do that report and they make really good recommendations. The Harmony Trust provides a report and a 20-hour educational program for $400. Um, you can otherwise get other providers to do things. You could also ask the court to provide an alcohol um, the assessment. Uh, they have providers that do it if the court is prepared to pay for it by ticking a box on the referral form when they do the pre-sentence report order. So overall it's a um, Serious matter, of course, a very serious charge is if a person's charged with involving um, drink driving, causing injury, or death. Uh, and a charge carrying um, death is up to 10 years imprisonment, two thousand sorry, twenty thousand dollar fine, and a minimum of at least one year or more's disqualification. Um, injury is up to five years imprisonment and a disqualification of a year or more. If you've got repeat offences or third or subsequent, uh, then that's relevant too and there are increased um, punishments in relation to the disqualifications. You've got to remember when you're dealing with victims that there's going to need to be a referral for restorative justice. You're going to deal with reparation issues. This is very serious if there's death or very serious injuries and your client could go to jail. So you've got to deal with that in a really responsible way and remorse is really important and a good restorative justice conference is really important. You need to plan your reparation. Where there's death, your client might need to pay for a whole funeral and that could be really expensive. Um, I had a case where that was $28,000. So so you're going to need to organise how that's going to be paid. And there is really very little credit if you're going to do that at $10 a week. So the maximum credit is if your person is able to take a loan to pay, or else a really decent payment plan. You should provide written submissions on these serious charges. You need to make sure you do a current search of the law and go uh, through um, the relevant cases. So in relation to the third or subsequent drink drivers and the death cases, there is some very helpful cases of um, Boswell and Scurrit and Cooksley that sets out the aggravating and mitigating factors in relation to charges involving death and injury. So for example, as set out in Cooksley, Aggravating factors concern the consumption of drugs and um, other legal medication or alcohol, um, ranging all the way to the motorised pub crawl, um, whether there's excessive speed, racing, competitive driving, showing off, disregarding of warnings from fellow passengers, prolonged or persistent deliberate course of very bad driving, aggressive driving, 
driving while the driver's attention is avoidably distracted, such as by reading or using a mobile phone, driving when suffering from a medical condition that significantly impairs their condition, uh, driving knowingly while deprived of sleep, poor or maintained a dangerously loaded vehicle, other offences committed at the same time, such as driving while disqualified, driving without a licence, um, driving a stolen vehicle, uh, previous convictions for motoring offences, with more than one person has been killed or more than one person has been injured, and multiple deaths, um, serious injuries to uh, victims or more than one victim, your behaviour at the time of the offence for the client, whether, they, whether your client failed to stop, whether they falsely claimed that any one of the victims were responsible, or tried to throw the victim off the bonnet of the car, or tried to avoid escape, or cause death in the course of dangerous driving to avoid um, apprehension and detection, and also if the offence was committed on bail. So those are some pretty serious aggravating um, factors in relation to the death cases. Also, you have uh, Clotworthy and the Samson case, which also set out some other aggravating uh, factors. So for Clotworthy, which sets out in relation to drink drivers, um, the, the aggravating factors concern the breath and blood alcohol level, the length of time that's elapsed between the last drink drive conviction, whether there's convictions for two or more drink drivings in close proximity, whether there was driving that was also dangerous or injury resulted, whether the offender was disqualified or forbidden, whether the guilty plea was entered at an early or late stage, whether there have been other sentences imposed for drink drives and how they responded to that sentence, whether or not the person's been sentenced to jail before, and whether there's any genuine remorse shown, and whether there's any efforts to confront and combat alcohol and personal problems, and then they consider any mitigating personal circumstances relating uh, to the offender. So Cooksley is an um, English case which is quite helpful and has been adopted for um, considering the factors that it might be mitigating may include if the person otherwise had a good driving record that might be where they've done a drink drive causing death and or injury and they have not got previous convictions for drink driving and the timing of a guilty plea, if they've got genuine shock and remorse, for example, they might have killed a close relative or a friend as well, and the offender's age, well, that would be relevant. We often get a lot of young people to whom a drink drive death cases, which is quite sad, and um, whether the offender himself has been seriously injured, that can be um, relevant. And of course you do get the cases sometimes where the people have killed their own family members. You've got to remember there's no fixed tariff of offending for a drink driving causing death cases, drink driving causing injury, or particularly in the third or subsequent drink driving cases. In relation to the third or subsequent drink driving cases, you know, where the maximum term of imprisonment is up to two years imprisonment, uh, in the case of Samson, just as uh, if I could set out a um, guideline of sort of general starting points, but he made it very clear he's not setting any tariffs. There's no tariffs uh, for this type of offending. And this is a general guideline. So if there's no serious or only moderately aggravating factors, your client could be looking at a term of imprisonment between 9 to 12 months. If there is one or more seriously aggravating factors, terms of imprisonment of 12 to 18 months imprisonment. Multiple offences with serious aggravating factors is 18 to 20 months imprisonment. And multiple offences are very serious aggravating factors, including offending of the worst kind, 20 to 24 months. And his honour stated in that case with Samson that you've got to take care when relying on Preston because every case uh, varies and you've got to consider... Uh, the sort of sentencing methodology is the best way to approach it. So the methodology that the court adopts in dealing with these third or subsequent drink drivers, and also in the serious death cases, is that the court must assess a starting point, and then um, they consider the aggravating factors, which can up the starting point, and then they consider mitigating factors that can reduce it, which does include uh, guilty pleas. So your serious aggravating factors is your level of intoxication and your close proximity to other drink drive offences in the criminal record. So the five-year period is really important, and when you're catching them in the five-year period, it looks really bad. And of course, if you're doing it within a four-year period, you've got issues with car confiscation as well. So mitigating factors that um, being held to be uh, relevant in the uh, Samson case included an absence of seriously aggravating factors, high levels of remorse, genuine attempts to address the underlying causes of offending. And that's really important. That's where you get in your therapeutic jurisprudence and you want to be working with your client on a holistic basis. So a defence lawyer uh, you know, using 
therapeutic jurisprudence and a, a law practice that's offering problem solving justice with a solution focus sake and with referrals to treatment, um, integrated uh, services and referral processes is the way to go because you're going to get that person the best sentencing outcome because you're going to be rehabilitating them, working with them to address their offending needs because they want to be motivated hopefully to stay out of jail. It just depends how chronic your person is addicted because the, the key thing is dealing with the addiction and the drinking and drying the person out and then moving them forward off the drinking. So that will depend on their level of dependency on alcohol and whether your person's an alcoholic and, and the severity of, of, of what's going on then whether they're able to achieve sobriety by themselves um, and, and whether they're able to sustain sobriety on release from a residential rehab. So it's a, it's a tricky thing, but that's really important, the, the remorse, the efforts to rehabilitate and to deal with the problems. You've got to know what your client's problems are. So that's really important when you're engaging with a client the first time is you've really got to know this client. You've got to get comprehensive information on their personal circumstances. You've got to know about who they're living with, where they're living with, what their job is, what their income is, what their debts are, about the vehicles, why they did the offence, their personal problems, whether they're being victims of childhood sexual abuse, whether they've got current stress problems, relationship problems, why they're doing this offending, what's going on in their criminal history, and go through their conviction history and work out what's been going on. Is there a pattern? Some people have quite interesting patterns and you're reoffending every 10 years and it's you've got to get to the bottom of what's going on with that person and then work with them to constructively try to resolve those issues. If they don't resolve the issues and they keep offending, they will end up in jail unless you're able to put them through the alcohol and other drug treatment court and even then they've still got to comply with treatment to not go to jail. Sometimes it's so messed up that the only option for public safety is they've got to go to jail. But it's, it's your job to do everything you can to help that person to get them the best possible outcome. So going back to our mitigating factors, the judge will also be looking at what the previous sentences were, um, whether there were any previous sentences of imprisonment, whether there were any previous sentences that, that but they didn't have a rehabilitative focus. Because you can use the Sensing Act, Sensing Act and Purposes part of the legislation to persuade the judge that this is appropriate for a rehabilitative purpose in sentencing. And you can use the remand period on bail to do rehabilitation and to get that underway in solid. So you've got a solid base of a rehabilitation, a solid base of sobriety with perhaps confirmed AA meetings as well, certificates from all your rehabilitation programs to confirm you're on the straight path now. Um, that will really, really help you to get the best result. The people who are not remorseful, who will not change, who will not go to the courses, they are not going to get a good sentencing outcome. If you do not guide your client to tell them where to go to the programs, they will not know where to go necessarily and they will not get a good outcome. You need to engage with ethic of care principles so that you can help your client get the best sentencing outcome. But you want to increase their wellness as well, their wellness for them, their family, their community, for all of us who live in this society. By helping your clients be the best person they can be, we will all help each other and we will keep the road safer that way. And that's part of a holistic approach. It embraces the therapeutic jurisprudence as an underlying philosophy. And it's about caring and involves an ethic of care. The court's also interested in lengthy gaps between the current and prior offending. Um, you, you got yourself in, in difficulties when it's all clustered together, in which case you really got to um, sort all those matters out. So the court's got to consider the sentencing act and the principles and purposes under section 7 and section 8 of the sentencing act to hold the offender accountable for the harm that's been done, promoting the offender a sense of responsibility, provide for the interests of the victim, provide for reparation. If it's substantial, you want to keep that person in work. Ideally, if it, you want to pay it in a lump sum, that's much better, or big chunky sums of it. Um, the court's got to denounce the conduct, got to defer that person and other persons from committing a similar offence, and they've got to protect the community from the offender. So that's quite important because if your person is rehabilitated and their risk of reoffending has gone down to a low category, then there's less need to protect the community from that person by locking them up. Of course, New Zealand loves to lock people up at a cost of 100000 per year, and we've got building prisons for a billion dollars here, there, in the management contract. So we're a very big container process of criminals where we put them in jail and 
nothing happens to them, then they just come back out and repeat the process again and again and again. So you need to work hard as a lawyer to help your client not become part of the revolving door system of the courts. That's really important. Um, and do help them increase their well-being. And the court plays a role as well because in the Sentencing Act it says that the court's got to consider to assist the offender in their rehabilitation and reintegration and in a combination of those purposes. So uh, to get the best outcome, you want to be lowering their risk of reoffending and assisting in their rehabilitation. Discounts are available for early guilty pleas. You want to make the best of those discounts. Um, setting out the groundwork before you do it so that hopefully bail's not revoked. Um, considerable credits are available for rehabilitation efforts. And also there have been some generous discounts provided in the case law for having stable work and family life. You see that um, even though it's Mr. Sampson I didn't get the Lord's greatest sentence. Um, he got a considerable discount. He got 15% um, uh, for um, his stable work and family life. So it ranges from 50% to one third for that kind of thing. And the court's got to impose the least restrictive outcome. The court's also got to take into account the offender's family, personal, whanau, community and cultural background. So that'll be relevant if you've got um, some submissions there to make. And as a defence lawyer, you want to do the best with Clotworthy. Clotworthy has got a great little paragraph in there that I love to use in my submissions, and I really make that work to the fullest extent when I've engaged in rehabilitation. His Honour Justice Wilde said in Clotworthy, and I quote, a sentencing judge's discretion to extend to an offender real leniency on an appropriate occasion is never to be taken away, end quote. So these are very important words and a guideline judgment for repeat drink drivers that can be used by a holistic defence lawyer applying the therapeutic jurisprudence approach. And that's for your client that's actively working on resolving his issues, who's working hard on completing his programs and doing all the right things. You're going to need a probation report from community probation. You're going to need an appendix report. You're going to need to gather a home that's going to work for electronic monitoring. Uh, you, you're going to need to um, have references. Your client, if he's attended the One for the Road program, residential rehab, or even CADS, he should take or she should take the opportunity to write a letter of reflection of what they've actually learnt from this court process of, of the offending, the rehabilitation, and the fact of going through sentence, because they've been through a lot. And they've had a chance to think for a lot. And God help them if they've hurt someone or killed someone. They need to reflect on that too. And some of the people have done um, causes such as the Harmony Trust One for the Row who've met the victim, Tamaji Paul, who was involved in a very serious accident where the offender killed himself and, and rendered the victim, Tamaji Paul, unable to walk and, and talk again. Um, meeting him is a very, very big shocking experience. And you can have good men suddenly faced with the prospect that they could have done that. And if your person isn't an alcoholic and they have just sort of been approaching the whole situation wrong and not having enough proper alcohol education and perhaps, you know, working as a digger operator and digging, hill, digging holes and getting hot, drinking in the car park and driving home and having arguments at home and driving off or driving home from the pub, but just really not giving the whole situation a whole lot of planning. This can be the thing that can can help stop them from reoffending because they're faced with real consequences to somebody else who's quite an interesting motivational speaker and can make an impact. Of course, if your person is an alcoholic, they're very selfish people and that's not going to work and they're really going to have to go to residential rehab or some other more intensive program as well as the Harmony Trust and you might want to do that rehabilitation program and then do the Harmony Trust. The Harmony Trust is a great program. It, it's really designed targeting recidivist drink drivers to make them think about the consequences of their actions. And so in, in that regard, it's even more, it's more powerful than all the CADS courses. CADS is also opposite offering a um, quite an interesting program called the CAP program, which is their abstinence program. And uh, that's a really good program too. And I do think that the Care New Zealand program is also really helpful. You've also got your Salvation Army, your Higher Ground, your Odyssey House, and another range of programs, including some private rehab such as uh, the Retreat. So working with your um, offenders, you want to adopt an approach that's going to work really well um, with them. You want to motivate them uh, so that they will do everything they can to advance their situation. You want to remember when you're in court, be punctual. Be better than punctual people. Be there 30 minutes, 15 minutes beforehand. 
My cases almost get called first every time I'm near 9.45. I'd be more, most of you there. And I will not be buzzing around the prosecutor as though she's a honeypot and I'm the bumblebee. No, because I will have my disclosure. I will have done my submissions. I would have handed them in. I would have had my information. I'm sitting at my desk. I've unpacked. I'm organised. My client will be there sitting. We've had our briefing. We're ready to go. So if you're buzzing around the prosecutor trying to find out information, what does that say? It says you're not organised. You need to be organised and prepared when you're doing these cases. You need to plan your cases out. You need, from the moment you're meeting your client and taking instructions, to be preparing a case action plan. Your case action plan covers what you're going to be doing for your client in your legal relationship. And you need to have talked about that. You need to have some measurable goals that you're going to deliver for your client, even if that's just the best sentencing outcome. And you should be working hard to do that. You need to be listing on your file what your land transport act applications are and what applications apply under the Sentencing Act, including whether car confiscation applies and whether you need to do the statutory declaration. And you need to get those done early. And if you're going to do a Section 94 or a Section 81 application, that you get on, do your affidavits, your submissions, and you file them on time or early. You know, your client is either paying for you to do it, so you need to get it done, or you're on legal aid, they're still actually paying because the system's paying. Even if you're doing it pro bono, if you're a professional, you need to deliver a plan, and you need to deliver services and be accountable. And when you set goals and you say to your client, right, well, um, you've got appointments to go and see CADS on these dates, and you're going to finish your call on these dates, so therefore I'm going to need the certificate on this date, and I'm going to be filing documents on these dates, and I need you to do this and that by then, you're all on a plan. Now I often write for my clients things called job sheets. A lot of people in jobs have job sheets. It's just a piece of paper in a letterhead that has job sheets. And I give the clients little jobs. One, get a work reference. Two, make appointments at such and such place. Or sometimes I'll make the appointments for them if that will help them. Two, get a work reference. Three, get character reference. Four, write your letter to the presiding judge. So in respect of writing your letter to the presiding judge, some people's reading and writing is quite terrible. In which like I say, do a draft, have a go, and if you can't spell any words, no problem, ring up Joyce, she'll tell you how to spell it. Or you can ring her up and dictate it over the phone what you want to say, or you can come in here and see me, Joy, one of Steffi or Joanna, we'll type your letter up for you, and you tell us what you want to say. Clients actually like that, and they ring up and give dictation to my section over the phone for their, for their remorse letter and to explain what happened on the one for the road, and she types it up and emails it out to them or posts it out to them, and it's their words, it's just spelled correctly, and it's all nicely set up on a piece of paper, typed. Um, and that helps them convey what they want to say. And then you want to do your written submissions and you need to hand it in early. It's a really big problem giving a judge a big wad of submissions on the day of the hearing. Because you can't read it all and your client's not going to get the best outcome on that basis. Also, if your client gives you references and you just sort of wave it at the prosecutor, go up to the judge and then wave it over there, that's no good either. I file my stuff early and I um, staple it together or I bind it and I have tabs going down the side, 1 to 10 or 11 or whatever the documents are, and I write a little cover letter at the front itemising what's in there. And, and then we make sure it's handed in at least a week before. Sometimes I'm ready months early and I hand them in months early, but sometimes your cases are put off three months for sentencing. And it might be what the al we were applying for the alcohol interlock. And I do a notice of motion for that so it's clear we're applying. I put a copy of Section 65A behind it, a copy of the Land Transport Act information on how much it costs and what the process is. I put the work references, the character references, the remorse letters, the rehab certificates, um, all the different things that clients manage to collect um, behind in, in a... In a in a, like a report and I hand it in early and it, and it gets to the judge and the judge has often got that um, and he can see that at the same time he sees the pre-sentence report and he's already able to make a favourable impression about the client because he's got all the rehabilitation certificates. And even if you're still struggling to write some submissions about something there's no reason why you couldn't file all that stuff early. But you shouldn't be struggling with things for the last minute. If you're hired last minute, that's a problem. You're probably going to need to ask for an adjournment to do the things you need to do. But you should just get on with it. You need to make a plan, know what you need to do, have a date when you're going to get it done, and do it. That's really important. And you need to work with your client to make sure they give you the information when you need it. So you need to give your client your little job sheet to tell them what they need to do.
Now, I've even managed to work with um, clients who are homeless and other people without all these resources and fancy things by telling them we need to do this and that. And if you're really clear and you tell them about the days and they can sort of vaguely get that going, they'll turn up with the things they need or they'll report in or somehow ring you and let you know. And they also are motivated to, to come and they understand what's going on and they're participating in their wellness. And I think the other thing that's quite important is that you're empowering your client. You're empowering your client by giving them things to do, um, by getting them the wellness. And it's part of that therapeutic jurisprudence and updating each time you have an appearance of how things are going with the counselling. And you want to be also giving them positive feedback that um, that's going well and Sometimes it's not going well and they and they get biffed out of the rehab place. Well, okay, just find another one and, and have a backup plan. So you have plan A, you might have to work your way down to plan C, but there should be a plan for something. And um, sometimes, as happened uh, recently yesterday, the kindest thing is for someone to go to jail. So you have I had a lady yesterday and she got brought to my office for her third or subsequent sentencing and she wasn't sober. And she couldn't stand, she couldn't walk, and she was on the floor. And they, relatives decided they wanted to carry her to court because they couldn't cope with her anymore. And she'd been slitting her wrists and then sent home and been to rehab and got out again the day before and was offending again. I mean, that's a big call to decide what to do with someone like that. Whether you just say, look, I'll just go up to court and there's just no point bringing her. So you can't you know, manhandle that person, but the family made a decision that they were going to bring her to court. And then when the client had a chance of a bit of sleep and we talked to the judge about it, the judge says that she couldn't carry on the way she was going. You know, she didn't actually want to die. And um, so I was resolved that I would just tell the judge the truth. So she'd been through some rehabs and detox twice and she still couldn't stop drinking. So the kindest thing that could happen to her was to go into custody because she needed to be detoxed in custody and she'd also done another offence so they were waiting for the blood charges to come. So you've got to weigh things up as they are and I will go back and work on that case again. So she was doing everything right but alcoholism is a really serious disease and you can easily have people that right there and it's all going so good and it all goes so wrong for them and then you just need another plan. And it's difficult to get people um, into rehabs when they're really desperate, when they're really drinking. They've got to, they've got to be dry for a while and there's a waiting list. So um, it's a lot of short um, supply on rehabilitation facilities. So just keep trying and keep working with your person and be there uh, for them. I um, also think that it's uh, quite important to set some boundaries and uh, be safe with the person. You don't want to get involved in all the alcoholic um, dramas. I um, ha I have full office staff looking after me. I've got full-time secretary. I've got the two legal assistants plus the spare one and the practice manager. So I prefer all the phone calls to go through to the office. I don't want my cell phone going all the time because I'm in quarter I'm with people. And, I have, and I'm able to have the phone answered all the time and then so we can give information and look after them and then I can call them as required but you know if they're just ringing so that they ring all the time to give little updates and it's just part of the process. I also think in doing your client care letters and arrangements with people that um, you need to be clear and knows what you're going to be doing for, the, for them and also about the fees. So I always do a fair agreement with that so they know what the costs are going to be because ultimately they still are paying for a service. And even if you think that they're not because it's legal aid, well, it is. You're being paid to do a job and you're being paid to do it right. And also you've got your own professional reputation and things to look after. So make a plan, be organised, be prepared. I also wrote some papers to um, explain to you how the drug court work. And that's quite a interesting court for itself. And that, that may be something that would be good to put someone in. So often if I get... Uh, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 13th time drink drivers. They need to be within the Auckland or Waitakere catchment area to make that work. And they'll need to have a CADS assessment report ordered by a presiding judge. And then if they've got a dependency and there's a space in drug court at the determination hearing, the drug court judge might admit them. Then they're probably going to be in that program maybe 18 months. And it's a lot of hard hard work. But it offers an alternative to imprisonment and an opportunity for them to be the new them because the judge is going to completely 
um, in, investigate their whole life and then try to improve everything. So it's it's a really good option. It needs to be rolled out throughout the whole of New Zealand, but it's currently only available in those two uh, locations. And for the million dollars, for you know five hundred thousand dollars in each court, it's running out. It's it's a really good option because it costs a hundred thousand dollars per year to pe people in jail, and our jails are full. We're spending a billion dollars on building jails, so it doesn't really make any sense. And the court at the alcohol and drug treatment court. Um, for example, in um, Waitakere's got quite a really strong Maori focus and they also um, have that um, also in um, Auckland and that they've integrated um, the, the language and some cultural aspects into the um, program and that really is working really well and um, they've had really good reports that it's been really quite um, successful and internationally drug treatment courts have been really successful. The underlying philosophy in drug court is this therapeutic jurisprudence approach with problem solving justice and the conclusion in the most recent report assessing the five-year pilot plan is that the alcohol and drug treatment court is seen as giving high-risk and high-needs offenders an opportunity and the tools to change their lives through access to and engagement in alcohol and drug treatment. The consensus amongst stakeholders, participants, whānau, is that the alcohol and drug treatment court is resulting in transformational change for graduated participants and for their whānau. For current participants and some of their whānau members, the court has reduced alcohol and drug related harm. Even exited participants have benefited from the alcohol and drug treatment court in particular, understanding the recovery journey and the services available like the 12 step program. So your 12 step program is your AA meetings and defendants within the drug court program are called participants. So it's it's been it's been a really good um, success really and you want to avail yourself of that opportunity for your clients. If your client doesn't quite make it into drug court because maybe say they only have four or five drink drives with a reasonable gap and the judge is indicating that they're not looking at a term of imprisonment and they're going to be perhaps in a range for an electronic sentence such as home detention or community detention, then there's this discussion about something called drug court B. And it's not drug court. It's just a nickname for it. But what it means is that the drug court judges took a bit of an interest in your client. She's read the reports. And um, she's decided to case manage your person, and your person will come back before the drug court judge when she's sitting on a judge direct day, which is not in the drug court, and your person will come back um, with progress reports on their rehabilitation. So it'll be assessed that, that your client's able to engage in the treatment providers voluntarily. They maybe they're going to do the 90 day bridge program, or the CADS CAP program, or some other kind of. Um, various programs and then go maybe on intensive supervision with community detention or home detention and then that process will be managed maybe over a six month period until they finish those programs and then get a sentence so it's um, really positive and actually some of those clients can't necessarily tell the difference just the drug courts very group intensive and intensified program and um, it's got its own culture and its own room with its own drug treatment team that is dealt with in a collaborative holistic basis and whereas on this sort of drug court B thing we just managed by one judge that judge is engaging in something called transformational leadership so she's trying to lead by example and inspire the person to do their treatment and get well and be the best person they can be but the court's not providing any resources for it they're not doing the drug and alcohol testing because in the alcohol drug treatment court they're having um, random and regular supervised drug testing and urine sample testing, and some people will be wearing an ankle bracelet, which is a tester called a scram bracelet to see if they've got alcohol or other drugs in their system. Whereas in this drug court B process, we're just being case managed, and they don't have all those fancy bells and whistles. But your person you will find generally responds really well to individual attention from a judge who's managing them, who's actually interested in them, and asks them how they do. And the judges working in the therapeutic courts actually engage with your offenders a different way. Your traditional judge will just um, maybe look at the paperwork and sort of mumble away sometimes or maybe not even look at the person when they pass sentence or maybe they do, maybe they don't. But your therapeutic judge is actually usually conversing with the client. It's quite a different way of representing them because you'll make submissions. Sometimes the judge is not really interested in counsel and wants to talk directly to the client. So it's a, it's a sort of a change in the dynamics there. Um, the clients really respond to that. 
because there's that carrot and stick approach that they, they actually don't want to go to jail. And they, and, and they like that she's interested and they, they feel some hope in the situation. And also it's an opportunity to keep their jobs as well. Because one of the first things to go on drug court in the first stage is usually your job. Because although you have to be working by the time you get to stage three to graduate from drug court, which is in stage threes, um, the first stage is treatment and, and many times they won't let the person work. And, and uh, you know, for most of your private clients, it's really worrying because they'll have a large amount of debt and they'll have families to support and it's really scary. And then um, having to go on benefit. But then, of course, if you're going to be sentenced to imprisonment, you know, you're not going to job anyway and you can't support anyone either because your income's taken away. So it, it's it's an alternative sentence and you have to balance those out in relation to your responsibilities. So overall, um, adopting this therapeutic approach will get you the best outcome at sentencing for dealing with a third or subsequent drink drivers. And to get the best outcome for your client, you need to know your client really well. You're not buddy-buddy with them, but you're collecting um comprehensive information by asking them questions, making notes, being productive and organised on the file and applying for all the applications that you can that will help them get the best possible sentence. And also being organised helps the court to be efficient. You'll find that the judges will respect someone that's organised and, and that your documents are well presented. If you come to court and you can't find your own bits of paper, that's really hopeless. So you be organised, be trustworthy and uh, do the best you can every day. I hope that helps. Thank you.